Hey there, this is Dan, you're watching the Salty Sea, and with Red Harvest uh, just around the corner, um, pre-orders, you know, going going great right now, and then uh, the game should be out next weekend. Um, a few people have put review copies that they got in advance on the uh, internet, so we have um, sort of the full rules suite, actually, for the game. Um, so I'm going to review that. We've also got all of the Warband rules as well. Um, those I'm going to do in a separate video. Uh, I think it's just going to be easier for future reference uh, for people, you know, once once this game's been out for ages, people are going to want to see the Warbands kind of in their own guide video. So I'm going to do that uh, separately, look for that this weekend. But otherwise, I'm excited to get into, um, into all of the new rules. Now, uh, I know some people like to see them, you know, if you had to track them on, to, on the uh, internet. Um, there's a bit of a potato cam issue a little bit with some of the rules, but um, I'm just going to flash them on screen for a little bit before I discuss them each time. So here's the terrain rules right away. And uh, there's just a couple things that pop out. So the first is uh, the Red Harvest board uh, has a bunch of lava on it. Uh, the rules for the lava are super clear, uh, or pretty straightforward. It's basically what you would guess. It's instant death if you fall into it. Uh, you actually can't jump over it unless you start two inches above it. So I guess like the heat of the lava, you know, stops you from doing it. And um, flyers, if they get pushed into it, are going to be okay. They don't have to take a uh, fall test if they're at the edge of the lava. But there's going to be the same thing with platforms, where if you're at the edge of a platform and someone gets a crit on you, uh, you roll to see if you get pushed off the platform, and then if you fall off, you take some damage. It's going to be the same way with lava, except you roll to see if you fall into the lava and you die if you do. Um, there's also a thing called Veronite Delve. So basically, all of the uh, sluices uh, is what they're calling the bobsled track that's on the board. Uh, it, they kind of snake around the board. They get in the way. You can climb up them really easily because um, they're not that tall compared to the fighters. And you're going to have to sort of navigate them for, to get from place to place for the most part. Um, and then if you get to one of the two terrain pieces that are sort of Veronite mining equipment, so it's either this one with the kind of lever it's a little like an oil rig with an angry face on it and then there's this one that's a little like a water wheel but with angry things on it um, if you get to either one of those you can use a double to turn it on and then anyone standing on a sluice takes just a bunch of damage it's like uh d6s just flying everywhere both for when you end on one when you start on one when you uh, have the middle of your activation be on one so um tons of punishment if you if that happens to you but there's no actual reward for using the sluices they're just kind of in the way sometimes but you can sort of avoid them too um so if you're going to punish players for for getting on them uh but you don't ever reward them for getting onto the bobsled track then players just aren't ever going to get onto the bobsled track right so um I don't love the way that they did it, but you know, maybe maybe you're going to get stuck on it sometimes just because um, the way the terrain is laid out forces you to be on it, and then you know sometimes you'll take a ton of damage. Um, I do think it's a bit of a missed opportunity here. I think they could have done more with it. I would have loved a risk reward aspect to it as opposed to just only risk, just which makes it just really clear what you should do with them all of the time, right? You should just avoid them. Um, and I'd prefer, you know, an actual game to be played there. But either way, um, I still think just in terms of look and in terms of three-dimensionality, um, it's still the best terrain set they've ever released for the game. And we'll get more into the three-dimensional part later. Um, actually, right now, with the victory conditions. Here, they, here are the 12 new victory conditions that come with Red Harvest. Um, and a bunch of them sort of require platforms, which I think is really interesting. It's going to make for more dynamic games, um, which I think is going to be really fun. Uh, a bunch of them, like, you'll get a certain amount of points for if you're on, or not a bunch, there's only a few, but you'll get a certain amount of points if you're on a platform with an objective, and a certain amount if you're not on one, and that'll be less. And so that'll sort of 
um, encourage you to start climbing, which I think is really cool. Um, one of the videos I did uh, quite a while back was about how Warcry favors really chaff heavy warbands. And um, I sort of went through all of the all of the stuff to to tell you how much how much you had to had to play chaff every single time. Um, only two of the Red Harvest victory conditions of the you know quote unquote balanced ones. They do six balanced, six you know unbalanced ones that aren't for match play. Only two of the match play ones favor chaff heavy warbands, which I think is great. Um, before I think in the early game, it's like maybe two thirds of them really strongly, intensely favor chaff heavy warbands. So I'm really happy about that as far as sort of rebalancing of the game. Catacombs was a little bit better for that as well. Um, it shows that, you know, they do play the game. Um, they are sort of changing up what's what's being rewarded in it. And I think that's really great. The other big change that comes with Red Harvest, I think is actually the biggest of all of them. And that's the, uh, the fact that every victory condition in Red Harvest is gonna be four rounds. Um, so the base game, it's mostly three rounds. In Catacombs, a few of them are four rounds, most of them are five. Um, I loved how in Catacombs they sort of, they overcorrected because they wanted to see what it was like. And I think Catacombs games just take too long, but it was huge as far as being better for the, the tougher and slower warbands. Um, Catacombs actually starts you way farther apart from each other. Um, so it actually still punishes the slow warbands. But um, yeah, these four round missions are going to be um, just way better for certain warbands that just couldn't really function in some of the three, in some of the really fast three round mission games, right? There would be times where, you know, you, part of your warband would come on round three and just not affect the game whatsoever, um, which really stunk if your opponent the thing that comes on round three for them was like a 10 inch move flyer and it was going to get onto an objective and kill something and then your whole deployment group did nothing so that's all been fixed um there's still six inch platforms that do favor s speed um if you saw the terrain flight is going to be really important so there are things that are being favored unfavored here but um, in general i do think that these four round missions um, are just a little more balanced there's also two that i think are really innovative um, that are also just way better for balancing the game um, reaper you score based on the number of wounds of slain models uh, catacombs has a similar one and i've played it um, it's really, really good as far as a lot of different types of warbands can function really well in it that aren't necessarily just the um, two heavy hitters and then only chaff models. Uh, because sometimes chaff models, uh, it gives your opponent a lot of flexibility for how they kill things. Also, technically, higher toughness warbands have a tiny edge. It, they're still disadvantaged by the fact that uh, toughness is just over overcosted in Warcry in general, but um, they they don't pay as high a price in in that Catacombs mission, and it's going to be exactly the same with Reaper in uh, Red Harvest. Uh, Might Makes Right is also really interesting. It's a regular objective mission, but with a kill bounty that you get points for um, on objectives. So you'll get a point for winning the objective, but then you'll also get points for any time one of your fighters around the objective kills an enemy fighter that's also around the objective. So winning the objective is important, but you could win the objective and still be outscored on that objective um, by your opponent. And I think that that is fascinating, really good, right? Because chaff are still going to dominate as far as just the objective secure, right? But they're also going to be a liability, right? Tiny 35-point models are just going to be a liability for giving up secondary points. And a lot of the time, secondary points are actually going to um, outnumber the primary sort of objective points uh, on this mission, which is really cool. Also, um, a lot of people complain about ranged being too strong. Um, 
ranged warbands like double thunder fist list right thunder fists are not going to score the bounty points because they shoot from 10 inches away um they're going to be sitting there shooting at the objective that's normally what they do is the noblar swarm the objectives the thunder fists blow you off the objective and then they win right really easy ogre wins for that um it's why ogres are one of the most powerful uh Warbands as lead belcher leaders are so good at that. Uh, they won't get the bounty points, and something like a Noblar will be a liability for giving, giving up secondary points, which just really changes the balance of what type of warband is good in, in this mission, which I think is really great. I love that they're thinking about that. They're um, providing new sort of interesting uh, missions to do. Um, I can't wait to sort of play these out, test these out with different types of warbands and seeing uh, what's effective. Um, let's also get into the twists. Uh, twists are kind of a funny part of Warcry, right? When Warcry came out, I think a lot of people, um, stupidly, you know, some dumb people, uh, disparaged it for not being very strategic. And I think the reason or the way that a lot of those people were just sort of bad faith actors, um, people who were just like, I like the big game and you know anything less than an army just isn't strategic. Um, but a lot of them, I think also, were people who played one or two games, got a twist card that was just ass, and then were just like, this game is dumb. Like it was over before it even started because like the twist and the deployment just made, meant that I had no chance. Um, the base game has 36 twists, about 12 of them are really good, really interesting. The other 24 either do nothing or just completely ruin the game. Um, I think in general, I've just like thrown those ones out. I'll do it. I'll do a video uh, just on twists uh, sometime in the future. But for now, yeah, it's really easy to just get an awful twist um, and have it just completely ruin your game. And in Red Harvest, it's kind of the same, right? So Red Harvest brings in 12 new twists to the game and they, they fall into two different categories. One is uh, really interesting tactical adjustments for anyone who likes getting into the strategy of the game. Um, demonic presence, arachnid nest, at my com here, five of them basically fall into that category. Um, and then the rest, uh, the most generous way I can say it is I'm drunk and I want something crazy to happen. Uh, if you're drinking and playing at the same time, Warcry is a good game for that. Um, but some of these will be really fun in that case. Like Creature in the Dark is, um, it's just like, it's wild. First, there's no ranged stuff over six inches. And then also there's a creature that just comes and kills things randomly. Um, that's either, well, Every game, it's going to completely dominate the game. None of the decisions you make are going to matter because it's just whether you roll and the creature kills one of your most important fighters. Um, so that's going to be great if you're sort of wanting something crazy to happen. But if you actually want your decisions to have an effect on whether or not you won the game, uh, you're not going to want to do that twist. So one of the things that I think is really important for making sure people have fun in Warcry is uh, actually separating out the really swingy, ridiculous twists from the really interesting tactical twists and just having two separate twist decks and deciding what kind of game you want to play. Um, the base game, about two thirds of the twists are in that sort of wanting crazy things to have. Actually, that's not true. One third are interesting tactical twists. One third do really crazy things. And one third only ruin the game. It's not even in an exciting way. It's just... It just makes it so you have a non-game. Um, this is kind of like that too. Uh, for example, Tactical Guile is probably meaning to be a tactical adjustment twist. It just makes you flip two deployment groups. Um, it's not very exciting, but it's also not interesting because like, if it hugely favors you to have one deployment group on the board instead of in reserve, you're going to do it. Otherwise, you're not going to do it. Um, there's no actual decision there, even though it, it sounds like there would be. And it's a roll off, so only one player does it, which might confer a huge advantage, might do nothing. Um, so it's like Spike would hate it, right? 
because it's totally random. But Timmy's not going to like it either because it's not like a big interesting effect. Um, Awakened Machines is kind of like that too. So, you know, so they don't all succeed at the wanting something crazy to happen, but some of them do, right? Creature in the Dark is going to do really crazy stuff. Uh, the Ash Field is going to do really crazy stuff. Um, the only thing is just don't mix them and I think you'll be fine. Rising Hatred and Winds of Excess work for both. Winds of Excess is crazy. It's uh, every time you do an ability, you roll and if you if you win your roll, you actually don't waste the dice. You get the dice back for the ability, and you can do something else, which um, incentivizes just absolutely insanity as far as using the abilities. Which I think is good because abilities, the wild dice system in Warcry, I think has less of an effect on the game than it should compared to just like the base stats of every fighter. So um, so I I love that twist. Uh, let's get into deployment. Um, he, here we go. So one, there's no reserves coming off in a corner. Uh, that was one of the big things that could make non-games in the base game and also in catacombs is your reserve units just come off in a corner and then they just don't do anything the whole game. Uh, slow melee warbands would just instant lose if that happened. Here you can see there's a few where, um, you start off in the corner, but you're there round one. But there's none where you come on round two and are in the corner. You can always have a choice there, which I think is really important at, um, you know, lessening the extreme cost of having a slower warband. Um, because of all the platforms, speed is still going to be really valuable, um, but it's not just instant losses for slow ones. Also, in all of the matched play ones, there's always at least one reserve, which I think is great. Um, in the base game, there were matched play cards that started every fighter on board, and it just takes way too long because at least in later rounds, when every deployment group has been on the board, a bunch of fighters are dead by that point, so you're not playing the entire group, and so you're still moving quickly. When every fighter is on the board right away, it's like the first round is just such a slog and it takes forever. Um, so nobody wants that. And especially if they're moving up to four rounds, uh, just moving quickly, I think is really important. They're also really balanced as to which group is in reserve. So before, uh, your shield was almost always on the board round one, uh, which some warbands could really abuse, right? You could um, have your sort of shield deployment group set up with a really crazy combo in it like uh, living cities you can do this or um, iron jaws you would do this bone splitters you would do this um, actually any destruction because you just bring in an iron jaws or bone splitters ally and then you can do wa um, you know you can do stuff like that a lot of the movement abilities you do you abuse with that mechanic um, and so this kind of takes that out it makes it way harder to abuse the deployment mechanics um, by just having it be even odds what's going to be on the field and what won't. Uh, there's also somewhere there's only there's sort of even chance of it's you start with one deployment group on the field and two in reserve or you two on the field and one in reserve which I think is really interesting and I'm glad that it's even like that. Um, again just fewer ways you can gimmick it. Um, I actually really relied on gimmicking it in a lot of my more competitive warbands. Um, so that'll be really interesting as far as what makes a competitive warband in Red Harvest versus what makes a competitive warband in the base game. Um, I'm really looking forward to playing a bunch of Red Harvest and sort of figuring that out over time. Um, also, the distance that you start from the enemy has slightly decreased. Uh, it's only a half inch on average. I actually went through and <laughs> cataloged the difference in each one. Um, on average, it's only half an inch closer, but I think there's a lot less variance. So there's only one scenario where you start further than 12 inches apart from each other. Um, that one, you start 18. And mostly it's 12 with one where you start um, 10 and a half inches from each other. I think that's really cool. Um, again, a lot of the ones where you start really far away are just sort of auto losses. Um, there's a bunch in the base game where you start 19 inches away, and then there's also ones where you start 10 inches away. Um, 
And so this just takes out a lot of that variance, sort of standardizes it. I think that's good. Um, you know, the 10-inch the away ones, you could put your sort of ranged warband in a place where um, even without a ton of long distance range, you could still just blow off the other person's warband really easily. Um, you know, 10 inches is going to be harder to, to make work with that now. Um, overall, the deployments are just a little bit easier on the slower warbands. Um, but there's also a ton more terrain, which tends to favor flyers. So it's not it's not like, oh my God, now Iron Jaws are A tier. Um, it's just sort of just a slight easing up on, on those slower warbands. One other fun thing to talk about, or unfun thing really, is um, Warcry, at least this edition, seems to have been really popular. Um, so talking to people in the UK, they're still having a really easy time pre-ordering, but North America sold out of pre-orders like extremely fast online. Um, just about every retailer, sort of online retailer that I know of, uh, was out of pre-orders, um, you know, within a day or so. Um, previous sort of big GW boxes that they've set out this year um, have generally had a ton of leftovers. Whether that's intentional or whether it's sort of accidental overproduction, right? Because 2020 was Games Workshop's most popular year ever. They sold like gangbusters everywhere. Um, I wonder if that made them ramp up production a little bit and then, you know, maybe the growth wasn't quite as big as they thought. But like stores are giving discounts to try to get rid of their Dominion boxes at this point. Um, you know, there's tons of kill team boxes everywhere where you look. Um, so it's possible that they that they're now reacting by contracting a little bit on this Warcry box. It's also possible that they're just having shipping issues, right? And that would be why it's still really easy to pre-order in the UK, but you can't get it in North America. Um, it's doubtful that it's sort of a Cursed City situation. You know, for those who don't know, Cursed City um, was a sort of game that. GW is ready to sort of push everywhere and, and make be sort of the next big sort of RPG that was going to go with with uh, the AOS setting. And then they had some production issues and then like, zip, that was it. You couldn't get it anywhere. Um, they just had like a really limited run and that was all. Um, it's doubtful that that's going to happen here. Although if it is going to happen, we wouldn't have heard about it, right? They're not going to communicate to us. So um yeah keep an eye out uh i'm interested to see how this goes i really hope that uh that it's able to get out there to a ton of people it's also possible that they printed the normal amount and just warcry is just really popular in north america who knows um you know there are slightly different trends with the game in different countries um you know Brits all like to make fun of how much worse at AOS every other country is than them. Um, so there are differences in tastes among different countries. Um, so it's possible that demand is just way higher in North America, but um, I'm a little skeptical. I, I, I think it's more likely either GW is contracting a little bit or they're maybe having some shipping issues. Um, hopefully that means you will still be able to get it in the future. So there you have it, sort of a full rundown of all of the um, sort of terrain rules, scenario rules um, that are there with Red Harvest. I'm really excited about it. Um, I do think it changes the balance of the game in a good way. Um, now, Red Harvest is going to benefit flyers massively. That's going to become much more important. But otherwise, I think it opens up life for a ton of warbands that were kind of um, really disadvantaged in the base game. Also, uh the the spiders are too good meme they are going to be too good in red harvest as well but um you know a ton of people looking at the uh looking at the war bands were just looking and being like how the hell does dark oath ever go toe to toe with the tarantulos war band um and i think now we have a bit more of an answer here right because red harvest is different enough from the core game that i think that the uh sort of chunkier slower but 
uh, more survivable warbands are going to have a little bit more of a chance than they normally would. Um, so I'm really excited to uh, to get into that video soon. Um, you'll see that probably this weekend. And um, yeah, and then sort of go through that. And then I'm excited to also play test these games. I really want to get a sense for exactly how much Red Harvest is changing the balance of the game. Until then, may all your rolls be crits.